Welcome everyone to Screenfish Radio. I'm so glad you made the time for us as we talk about No Time to Die. This week, we are so excited to have an incredible panel of Bond experts or villains, depending on who you ask. And uh, I am really excited to have back uh, Dave Voigt, the creator of InTheSeats.ca. Welcome back, Dave. Well, thanks for having me as always, buddy. I always love having you on. And, uh, and a couple of newbies, if you will, to uh, Screenfish Radio. I'm so excited this week to welcome Tom Ernst. Uh, he is the former host of SNAM and is a writer with Original Sin and Northern Stars. He also has a podcast called Rewind and Fast Forward. Welcome, Tom. So glad you could join Thank us. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm glad you're here. I, I follow Dave Voigt wherever he goes. That's really the secret to su anyone's success. I was, I was ringing the bell, and we got people to show up today. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, uh, and last but not least, to the one who answered the call to that bell is uh, Tim Rideout, the creator of The Mind Reels. So thanks, uh, thanks for joining us, Tim. Oh, dude, my pleasure. Anytime anybody wants to talk 007, I am there. <laughs> Well, that and is Dave's totally right. I came in on Dave's coattails. He was like, this is the guy. Let's talk. So, yeah. <laughs> bring, <laughs> bring out your dad. <laughs> bring out your dad. That, that's going to be the new intro to my podcast forever now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you cannot go wrong with a little Python to start your day. So, um, no, uh, No Time to Die is the final J uh, Daniel Craig entry into the James Bond canon, where James Bond is enjoying a tranquil life in Jamaica after leaving active service. However, his peace is short-lived as his old friend from the CIA, Felix Leiter, shows up and asks him for help. The mission to rescue a kidnapped scientist turns out to be far more treacherous than expected, leading Bond on the trail of a mysterious villain who's armed with a dangerous new technology. No Time to Die is directed by Kerry Joji Fukunaga and uh, stars, as I said, Daniel Craig, as well as Remy Malek, Leah Seydoux, and Naomi Harris. Uh, it is currently playing in theaters. As always, this podcast is rated S for spoilers. So uh, just so you're aware, podcast plot points up for grabs. But guys, I would love to hear what you think of No Time to Die. Mm. Age, before, age before beauty, gentlemen, please go ahead. Oh, I, I cover both of those areas. <laughs> wow, I, I am beautiful as well as the eldest here. So I don't know. I guess that makes me go first. I cover both of those things. Um, first of all, I just want to say, uh, uh, Mr. Rideout, I, it just occurred to me, the Mind Reels, what a funny, what a great name. <laughs> it just all of a sudden the pin dropped and I went, oh, yeah. the Mind Reels. I get yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> um, very clever. Uh, okay. The new James Bond, uh, uh, S for Spoilers. So it, we can go anywhere here. Yep. Uh, I, 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 I enjoyed this one and I think I enjoyed it more than most people. Uh, that I've talked to and chatted with uh, because there's a fragility to James that was harkened back, not quite as dark, but certainly harkened back to Craig's first uh, uh, Bond outing. Uh, was that Skyfall? No, if it, uh, Casino Royale. Royale. Casino Royale. Hmm. Okay, so <laughs> it harkens back to his second Bond outing outing us in third, Skyfall. Third, third one. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's you who called me a Bond expert, not me. So, all right. Okay, let's go, let's go all the way back. Very dark in the first one. Uh, he's a killer, right? He's It's very dark. Go to Skyfall uh, and it's dark again. We have a, a traumatic past that he has to sort of come in grips with, which I thought was a really great uh, place to take Bond. Uh, and I fully expected to see Skyfall in the lineup of Academy Awards, both for performance and I thought an outside chance for Best Picture. I thought uh, it was a really strong bond. This one it sort of brings those elements in a little bit lighter, but we have James Bond making mistakes in this uh, film. He makes emotional mistakes. He makes judgment mistakes. Um, and uh, time and time again. 
uh, he is he, uh, at least three times he makes critical, critical mistakes. And I like that about this Bond. I also like that he was uh, a, a, a little bit sort of weakened by, by love uh, as Bond was in um, Her, Her Majesty's Majesty Secret, Secret Service. Service. Yeah. And, uh, and this just rang really authentic to me. I, I got tired of the Bond as superhero. I got tired of the Bond as womanizer. And uh, this was a Bond I really liked. Um, so saying that, uh, th this film r gets a pretty high rating for me. Skyfall is still number one for me of all the Bonds. And, uh, and then uh, this one comes in about, I guess, fourth or fifth. Now, you know what, just to dovetail off that, Tom, because I mean, I love how you said just how he made mistakes. And I mean, and you're right. He is a fallible Bond. And I mean, I think mm. Craig's Bond throughout all the five movies, he's probably been the Bond that we've been the most emotionally invested with. I mean, from the scene in Casino Royale, when he sits in the shower with Vesper after brutally murdering those guys and then. And then as the character evolves, and as we see here, he's really sort of getting emotionally involved and we're invested. He's invested in these people and we're invested in the characters. And I mean, as, and I mean, we've all talked about this separately off air, but I'm with you, Tom, that like, I definitely think Skyfall is probably the best out of the Craig canon. But for me, I'm putting this like sort of right behind there because it's such a fantastic ending and it really gives closure to this character that, quite frankly, in the history of Bond, I think is the first time we've actually given a damn about James Bond, the person. Yeah. Well, and you're totally right there because for the first time we've had a character arc. Most of the time Bond, like take Connery or more, they're just reflections of the time and, right. and the, thought, the thought behind it. Whereas now they've developed this mythology, this arc, this story for all of them. That, uh, that never existed before because any of the other bonds, you can kind of just plug and play and just pop in and out. But if you go from Casino Royale through Quantum of Solace, through Skyfall, through Spectre to No Time to Die, there is a through line for the character, which hasn't happened for the series before. There's an actual development to his character. So you feel for him this time. It's interesting because I would say with Brosnan, they tried. But I mean, in the 90s, they're just it, it, it was loose at best. Like mm -hmm. if you look at most franchise, even the Batman franchises, they would say that they were technically building on the last one, but it was very, very wafer, wafer thin. And I remember when World Is Not Enough came out, and they were like, "Bond is he? He's never he's never killed a woman." And it was like this was a grand moment for the franchise, which you know, <laughs> twenty years later, uh, after Me Too and all these things, it's sort of like, yeah, that that was the big victory, was it? Right. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, but I love what you're saying. This, this film, although I don't think it was necessarily planned as a five film arc, no, no. feels like a five film arc. Yeah. And, and that is something that I think is truly unique to, to Craig's Bond. And, uh, and I think it's a reflection of, of the time. This is what people are looking for is more of a through line story, I think as well. Um, yeah. what, what, do, what else do you think? What do you think Craig, uh, we've already sort of talked about it, but Craig's bond, what, what do you think he contributed to the, to the canon? I think he brought a lot of back, sorry, brought a lot of Ian Fleming's original character back to the story where he's a little more hard edged. He's, he's got his vices. He's, he knows he's a killer and he knows he's good at it and does his job, but he's still a human side. One of the, moments I pointed out to my partner was this is the first time we actually see Bond cook. I mean, and in the original novels, he likes food. He likes to cook. He likes to, you know, he has his, his home, his housekeeper may who will come in and make meat meals for him. And he knows what he likes and he knows how he likes his eggs done and all this stuff. So the, there were little moments throughout no time to die. That I'm like, Oh, that's a real nice kind of callback to like the novels and the actual literary canon. So to give Craig the chance to do that was just kind of cool. So, and I just wandered away from the question on my own little foray but, there. So. But now I have to watch <laughs> the film again. I certainly don't remember him cooking. I remember Q yeah. trying to cook. Yeah, he made, uh, he made breakfast for the little girl. He did. That's yeah. right. Oh, yeah. how sweet. And she didn't like it. <laughs> so. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I mean, you know, the other side of this whole 
Craig arc with Bond, it made it like he was human. Mm-hmm. Like Daniel Craig's Bond got his ass kicked repeatedly and often. <laughs> I mean, even when you think back to that moment in Skyfall when he shot and sort of adjusts his collar jumping off the crane, you know, it's like, okay, like in other Bond movies, he wouldn't be bleeding if that had happened. But I mean, from every single one of these films, Bond was not Superman. Bond was just this guy who would go above and beyond. And I mean, I think that's what brought him down to earth and made him this really sort of, again, almost likable character especially towards the end of the sort of the arc of the films and i mean particularly in this one like we we empathize with his journey especially as he's you know falling out of cars and getting hit by cars and doing god knows what else you know you yeah. say almost likable i thought we liked james bond well i we thought that was- what i mean <laughs> the great question he is like he start he is one of like you're not supposed to like him but you like him oh <laughs> this is new to me. I didn't like know him. that. Realistically, <laughs> well, I'm always rooting for the wrong guy. Then um, that's that's actually right. Um, I did mean, we really, really like Connery. Did we ever really like more Brosnan? They were always sort of these archetypes and just reflections, the pompous reflections of their time. Well, I think as critics, maybe maybe we didn't like them, but I think as audience members. We were we were eating the eating them up, uh, 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 sort of like just loving what they were doing. I, Moore, in particularly, who was uh, you know uh, uh, whose whole gig was to be an audience pleaser, um, and I don't criticize Moore for that. I criticize no. the writing, etc. Uh, those were the worst bonds, I think, um, but uh, there were also the ones I grew up on. Um, but yeah, no, I've never. I, I'm not. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying it's a perspective I, I've not taken or even acknowledged before. Uh, certainly, if you ask my daughter, who's 14, and when I first showed her, uh, I think it was Doctor No. Uh, oh dear. Yeah. Oh dear. <laughs> she was there when the old lady came out of the the toll booth <laughs> and started mowing people down. She loved that. But as soon as Bond grabbed a woman and she said no, so he grabbed her harder and kissed her, she jumped out of her seat. She was probably about eight then, uh, jumped out of her chair and yelled in front of the entire audience, you're not a good man. That's illegal. You're a bad guy. You're no hero. And she has refused to watch Bond ever since. She would agree with you. Bond is unlikable. See, and and I think, I, I think now maybe we're wise enough to say how unlikable he is. Like, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I didn't, obviously I didn't grow up with Connery and, and Moore per se. I, I grew up with Dalton and, and really Brosnan was the first time I really cared about, about Bond when I, when that, when uh, Goldeneye came out. But uh, I always liked, I always liked Connery. Um, but the, I mean, the, the films themselves were just, you know, hyper, hyper masculine male fantasies, if you will, if you will on that, um, which is one of the things I love about, about Craig's bond is that the films bond didn't just grow. The films grew the world's, the world changed around him. Like I think Brosnan at the time if I'm misspeaking, I might be, but was seen as more progressive than the other Bonds. And he was the same type of character and the world was the same sort of thing. He was just a bit nicer about it. You know what I mean? But but the toxic the toxicity was still there. And with Craig, one of the things I found particularly interesting, especially with uh, the last one, which was Spectre. I felt like in Spectre, they were really trying to steer it back to, hey, you know, not just with the name Spectre, but the style of story. They were trying to push it back to the old type of Bond. We gave you a new Bond. We're going to give you an older Bond. And it doesn't work. They made him tell more jokes. They made him be a little uh, a little colder and, and, and more aggressive. And, and it doesn't work in the same way that it does in Casino, Casino Royale. I love that, that uh, M just calls him a blunt instrument. <laughs> and talk about the blunt instrument to the guy who is talking about how he, he sees or that his daughter has her eyes has or and how he knew that. And there's a sensitivity about him like that's an arc that's change. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I find that particularly interesting in so many ways. Like I, I do like the old bonds. I do. I oh, don't like yeah. the more ones as much. I admit it. I just, no, <laughs> but I, I could, I have uh, uh, limited to times that I really need to see uh, Sean Connery in a Terry cloth shorts and uh, beach, <laughs> beach shirt. Um, <laughs> I find, <laughs> but I, you know what? I, I don't know. I don't know if I would credit bond uh, himself for changing with the times. I think the times forced bond's hand mm. i don't th- i don't i don't think we could have uh, released a bond as he was um and and have people buy into it i think they needed to to update it uh and i think that's the same way with um you know you look like at uh, that's why we don't have any more dirty hairy movies yeah. right they just don't fly uh you were talking about bond kills first time bond kills a woman I'll never forget how the audience cheered. This isn't a Bond movie at a uh, Dirty Harry movie when um, he's on a train with this woman and her dudes are beat, trying to beat up Dirty Harry. He gets the best of them. And then she says, you wouldn't punch a lady. And he says, you're no lady and decks her. And the audience erupts, right? Yeah. Uh, um, it, it, these, these things just don't fly anymore. I don't think they can... Uh, I don't think they 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 hit the sort of um, collective unconsciousness of the public like it used to. No, but you know what? I mean, I think that just goes back to why Skyfall was such a pivotal moment in the Bond canon. Because, I mean, I remember seeing that movie. Cause, I mean, there was a press screening that we all saw. And then I went like a second time with some friends and people were going, oh, where was the Bond girl? Where was the Bond girl? I'm like, guys, M was the Bond girl. Yeah, mm. this was the story yeah. of him going home to mother and him going back home and sort of protecting his family and protecting his roots and trying to sort of be a better person than he was. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's where the character really did shift. I mean, we saw glimpses of it within the first two Craig Bonds with mm-hmm. him sort of being this very more of a human, like very fallible, very sort of gettable kind of character. But I mean, in Skyfall, we saw him take real hits, which was obviously the death of M. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there were so many things I thought were, were so different. And I personally, I think, I think they were wonderful, but I'm like, I, I kind of had to, to laugh to myself because I'm like, yeah, okay. Bond uh bond has it is he's monogamous and i know it's not Mm -hmm. for the first time in the canon but the only woman that he is he's intimate with is leah seydoux's character it's not he's not bouncing around he's not sleeping around even uh uh, ana de armas basically high fives him at the end and they go their separate (laughs) ways and i thought this is this is remarkable there's no tension i thought okay well you know, at one point in the film, I thought, okay, Leah Sedu is going to die, uh, which I can't. I only say her. her what, what was her character's name again? I, oh, Madeline. Madeline Swan's yeah. going to oh, die, yeah, right. and and there'll be some moment with him and the new 007, probably or something. But no, no, it's just strictly like that aspect of the character, which was a staple of Bond, especially for twenty films. Yeah. Um, yeah has has matured into a much healthier landscape uh i thought i thought that was really really fascinating and they even reference it Mm. in disarmament when they're in the room closet together and she's you know she's saying get undressed and and he's like shouldn't we have a drink first like no put on the tux (laughs) yeah 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 uh yeah i mean all those things have been sort of hit hit. I'm, i'm speaking a lot and tim you're you're i'm gonna allow you I've, I've yeah. been jumping all over you, all, uh, yeah. uh, but I wanted to say two things that well, they were fast on my mind, and and uh, that one of the is the shot, the sort of her, uh, dethroning of Bond as the womanizer, is uh, the the shot of Bond walking out of the the uh, the ocean, and whatever Bond movie that yeah. was, Casino Royale. Casino Royale, and yeah. that was, you know, uh, Honor Blackman, right? Yep. Many years earlier, uh, and uh, and and again, Holly Berry, a few years after that. Uh, so he sort of take took over that role, saying, "Here's one for the women." Uh, the other <laughs> thing is, 
is uh, the opening scene of, uh, uh, of the most uh, No Time to Die. I thought if you're going to talk about glass ceilings and the women's role in, 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 a, in a society of glass ceilings that they have to break through, was there no better analogy than breaking through the glass ceiling than the opening of No Time to Die? The water, underneath the water, break, trying to break through the ice, <laughs> assisted by the villain. But yeah. regardless, breaking through the ice, being yeah. pulled up through the glass ceiling. I thought there was no better analogy than that. Whether it was intentional or not, I don't know. But. Well, yeah, and then if you're going to talk about intentional stuff, I got, I got giddy through the entire movie. Uh, anytime Hans Zimmer incorporated, like, uh, John Barry's score from Honor Majesty's Secret Service, as yeah. soon as that cue showed up, I'm like, okay, there's going to be a more personal story here, and we know with we have all the time in the world, somebody's going to die. You just know that because that's what happened in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. The other thing I got really giddy about, and it's again, it's a literary reference to the Ian Fleming Bonds, was Rami Malek's Poison Garden was actually featured in the novel You Only Live Twice, which mm. was also set on an island in Japan, but wasn't a big secret island like the Sean Connery film. So all these little nods to both the you know the films originally plus the literary canon, it was. I got giddy the entire way through the film. I was just wowed. So I'm not sure I can speak as fluently as some of you guys are doing. I'm, I'm feeling a little out of my depth, but I'm just like, oh. yeah, if we want to talk Bond, let's go, baby. <laughs> well, yeah, you just you just confirmed your, your, yourself as a, a Bond fan to pick up on a, a Hans Zimmer score. Uh, but I, too, while I was watching the film, I thought when you saw uh, his, uh, Madeline lying uh, the next day in bed, with the sheets covered over, that was Goldfinger yeah. and the and well, the totally. asphyxiated body. Uh, yeah. The the fortress, the island fortress, was the man with the golden gun. Mm -hmm. um, and even the way uh, uh, Christoph Waltz is presented uh, only harkens back to when uh, Javier Bardem was the villain. But it's the same entrance, you know. Right. And the Ashton Martin, of course, both of them. Well, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, it was but, just, yeah. My father-in-law drove an Aston Martin. That's my little, I know that was <laughs> why I married his daughter. That's fair, I guess. <laughs> guns, the, no. <laughs> I, I have to say, with all the, the nods to previous Bond films that we saw, I was thrilled. I mean, I heard rumors back when they were in production that Rami, Rami Malek was going to be Dr. No. And I was thrilled that they only reference it rather than come out and say it like this guy is like you know with the the island the, it was nice to see a villain with an with a tropical island uh you know again well, like that was harkening back to the old days but i was dreading them saying you know the problem is specter i took them out because i am dr no and i'm like oh <laughs> i was i was nervous that that was going to be the case because <laughs> i don't think audiences would fall for that anymore though either though I mean, we saw like the only the thing I truly hated about Spectre was the Blofeld reveal. I thought that was just so moronic. I thought it spoke so badly about the series. I thought it played down to the audience. I thought it just treated everybody so badly to say, oh, they're brothers. Well, not brothers, but brothers. And and I love the fact that No Time to Die addresses it, but then carries on. But yeah, you don't have to talk down to your audiences anymore, even especially with action films. People people expect more now. Wait, you you mean in a film called Spectre, you expected <laughs> that the villain would be Blofeld? Wait, that's, that's, right? I, Who knew? I, 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 I don't know what you're talking about, Tim. I have right? no clue. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're right, yeah. Tim, because it, it's really interesting how the action film as a whole has gone really kind of split in two it's either gone the mission impossible bond way or it's gone the let's launch a car into space fast and furious <laughs> nine kind of way <laughs> there's no in between anymore there's not <laughs> and they're both enjoyable to be sure <laughs> well you you know it's interesting you guys say that uh, one of the questions that i had and i was thinking about with this one Time is a key theme throughout the whole film. It's, I mean, it's in the title. So, yeah. but so is die. As I was joking with Tom earlier, die is in almost every Bond title. It feels like anyway. But 
just just the concept of time is very very key uh, certainly with the wrapping wrapping up of craig's arc and whatnot but do you think that bond himself i'm not talking about craig but bond himself his time is up in our culture do we need to is is i know uh, it already said in the back james bond will return we know that there's going to be bond films for the next 50 years as well <laughs> but do you think that bond as a character is is no longer necessary i'm going to jump right on that i'm going to say i think he's always going to be necessary i mean and we talked to reference it a little earlier that the films themselves have always been a reflection of the times mm. so the character is just a reflection of that time and and even speaking in a realistic sense, there's always going to be a need for that blunt instrument, whether we want to admit it or not. Governments are going to need something like James Bond to kind of deal with problems that come around. I mean, they might not be as big as hidden bases and volcanoes. They might be a little, well, not simpler, but they might be a little more realistic than that. But I think, I think Bond's going to be around for easily another 20 years with all kinds of other films and more modernized villains maybe less pompous and dramatic or melodramatic but yeah i think i think he's here to stay they just he's going to adapt to the times again no I, I i wholeheartedly agree and i mean this is something just to throw out there but because obviously in no time to die we had the arc of him not being 007 anymore and him having to deal with that and the back and forth between him and lashana lynch and then towards at the end it's like I'd like Commander Bond to be reinstated as, you know, 007. It, it's kind of an acknowledgement that, you know, Bond made 007. 007 didn't make Bond. Mm -hmm. the, the, the name of Bond carries just as much weight as 007. Yeah. If that, because it's one of those things where it's like, I could see this franchise moving forward, even sort of in the current timeline, and then just handing out a code name of James Bond or something or like there's so many different ways they could be going with this. I don't think that a straight reboot is even necessary on this, the way they kind of ended it because it elevates bond it, the name of bond to that 007 status. You could put bond on anybody and they could sort of redefine what it means to be bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Tom, it looked like, were you going to say something? I, I wasn't. I was actually hoping you would skip over me on this one because I, I'm not sure how I feel about this. I think as, as a character, as we're, we're used to Bod, is, is time is up. But I think as the transformations we watched, he, uh, it, um, you know, there's always room for him. Uh, and I think, and, you know, and, I'm, and I'm going back to something Tim said about the, the villains in Bond, which are, in, to me, as identifiable as Bond himself. I think the Bonds I prefer are the ones with really arc, high arc <laughs> villains. I, I, love, I love the big bad guys who, who push buttons and the plane opens up to the guy who says, I'm, I'm out of this here. You know, fine, you can leave. And then they open up the trap door and he falls out of a plane or he gets <laughs> tossed into sharks. I love the, I love the bond that uh, uh, Dr. What's his name in the Mike Myers films? Dr. Evil. <laughs> Dr. Evil. That's such a hard name to remember, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Dr. Evil does it all the time, you know, kills off his, his minions. Uh, uh, and uh, I miss that about the villains. So that doesn't answer the question about whether Bond should exist or not, but uh, there, there is an essence of Bond that I would miss. And I don't, wouldn't mind if it went back to silly Bond, uh, at least with, as far as the villains go. Uh, but um, I don't know. I, I, I think my daughter's reaction that I told you about earlier really resonated with me. And so my uh, love of Bond really took a dive for a little while and I couldn't get her to see the Craig ones. I just cannot get her to go. And um, I, I, even though I know she would appreciate them more um, that doesn't answer anyone's question, but it's, it's but the you, ramble of which I went with. But, you know, I think it goes back to just how they wrote Craig and they wrote bond over these five movies and gave him these moments of evolution. 
because I mean, I'm like, I think on this and I wonder like, had this been anybody other than Craig, had this been written sort of in a very sort of different fashion, this could have just been another silly action franchise. They could have gone the more route or the Brosnan mm. route and just been very sort of superficial with it. But I mean, I think the evolution of Bond happened at the first one, because I mean, I think we can all say in 05, oh, should we have any more Bond movies? Well, they were fun, but eh, and we can all just sort of move on from them. I think the Craig arc has really sort of rejuvenated the idea of what Bond can be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like sense. your point. I like your point there, Dave. Uh, sorry, Tim, were you gonna say something? No, I totally agreed. And and my brain was kind of pinwheeling and thinking about all, all these kind of grounding of the dramatic character of Bond and how they've actually tried it a few times over the course of the series, but it's never paid off. I mean, I still contend that on Her Majesty's Secret Service could have been Connery's best if he had done it because of right. the whole dramatic yeah. art to it. Um, uh, Moore's uh, For Your Eyes Only was There Were No Gadgets. Yeah. It's a straightforward thriller. Um, live in, living Daylights with, uh, with Dalton, not to mention License to Kill, which took the you know the whole format into a different genre altogether as a revenge film uh goldeneye could have been a whole launch for brosnan to be a much more serious bond but the producers you know wilson and and broccoli kind of said uh, maybe not let's just play it safe so i think the series has begun building to daniel craig's bond and now lord knows where we can go because the whole world is kind of opened up for us. Like Dave said, I mean, maybe somebody gets assigned James Bond as a, as a project title or a name and 007 is just a number. So there could be a whole chain of 007 films. You don't need the James Bond name. You just need the 007. So yeah, I love it. Even die another day, which ended up being so silly. Just, I mean, the beginning it's like, Oh, he's been in a Korean prison for a year and he's pissed. Right. right? You know, but then they just go with, space you know space lasers and diamonds and all that other nonsense you know and ice chases and You're right uh, yeah and invisible cars <laughs> right uh. <laughs> but I, I i like what you guys are saying i you know it's funny I've, I've been thinking about this question a lot in regard especially in regards to this film and i really think that what we're seeing now culture-wide just let's separate from bond for a minute is is the fact that we're willing to reevaluate and reinvent our our icons, our so, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been all this talk in recent years about does Bond have to be a, a straight white male? Quite frankly, um, although it was interesting, Craig had an interesting comment which I thought was 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 quite interest uh, quite good actually. He said Bond can be anybody, still needs to be a male. If you want to create a female character to be that lead, create a new one, uh, which I thought was an interesting take, like like Lashana Lynch in this one, uh, mm -hmm. could lead her own franchise. Absolutely could lead her own franchise. Um, but she doesn't have to be James Bond. She can be, like you said, this this 007 or, or the separate icon. But I think, I think what we're seeing larger than this is now we're willing, because culture has shifted, you've got this tension of, well, Bond has always been around, so we want to keep that brand. What does that brand look like in a world that's completely different than it was three years ago, five years ago? And I mean, even um, I think it was it's the Batwoman franchise. Um, they they cast a Bruce Wayne. My understanding is there Bruce Wayne. I have, I have not seen it. I haven't because I don't have CW. I don't get to see it very much. Uh, but I think the Bruce Wayne they cast is an Asian male. And it's sort of like Batman is the American Bond in so many ways. Right. He's the American James Bond. Uh, casting type but but those sort of cultural pinnings that we associated with the character are now up for all sorts of incredible conversations which i think is so wonderful so i think bond i i can see bond continuing on if they continue that approach when they tried to force it back into the old mold uh in that like i said even inspector he's trying to tell more like they let him tell a couple of jokes in this one but they even make fun of the fact that he's not good at telling jokes in this one you know what's the worst thing about me is it my sense of humor you know they throw that in there in this in this particular film they let the, it didn't work because they were i felt like they were trying to fit into an old mold when they did that 
But when they when they released that, James Bond can be anyone. It could be Idris Elba. It can be it can be anybody. Um, I I think that's I think I think uh, the the name can go on if you continue to evolve it and the world around him, like like you see in this film. Well, I mean, I think that goes back to something because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, boys, but I mean, on this one, it did say James Bond will return, not Double O Seven. Did indeed, will return. yeah. Yeah, but on some Bond movies, will they have said 007 will return. Have they? Or has it always been James Bond? No, it's traditionally James Bond will return. Okay, all right. Because it just it just made me, like, it was the focus more, especially in this film, on James Bond, not sort of the structure of the spy game and 007 and this, that, and the other, and am I, you know, am I 6th or am I 5 or whatever it is. <laughs> just literally the person. It was about him coming back to do the right thing because he knew it was the right thing, telling off M because it was the right thing, because M was being a you know ponce, you know, and and it was just all this stuff that he did because he evolved the character past the 007 moniker, which I think was the important pull away from this one, and especially as they try to come up with new ideas going forward. No, I like that. And you, and you make a good point, especially regarding the moniker, because you throw out the name 007 and James Bond, and you think, you know, you think of those poses, you think of standing there in the tux. But I mean, if you look at Daniel Craig's Bond, he doesn't wear a tux very often. He's mm. very much gotten away from that image. It's a more rough and tumble image. So yeah, I love it. Good point. I mean, there's even other movies that have sort of broken away from sort of the image that we expect out of some of these movies. I mean, with something like Black Widow, where Florence Pugh was making fun of Scarlett Johansson and her poses every time, you know? <laughs> We've deconstructed the myth of the quote-unquote super spy and made these characters a lot more human over the years. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Well, what do we look for in a hero then, uh, guys, since we're having this conversation? What, is, what do we look for in a hero per se? I found that uh, Bond was most heroic, and heroic in, in Skyfall because that, for me, was when he was at his most vulnerable. Uh, going back to his childhood and actually acknowledging that uh, you are affected by uh, the traumas of your childhood. That's something uh, typical heroes uh, don't, don't go there. They don't, Batman did, uh, uh, but uh, he became a man who shut down his past right that became his dark secret that was that's what made the night dark in that case um where bond he had to actually travel back to this so i think the vulnerability uh, uh that and acknowledging things that 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 sound kind of um too ethereal to be real like the inner child the uh trauma and and things like that and that they affect you as an adult uh, is really what I, I look for in a hero. Uh, and it's always, it is always the uh, tipping point for me if uh, they can successfully uh, 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 mine that, that little field. Um, as opposed to the uh, cold as ice, I don't give a... I mean, I admire that. I just could never relate. I can never relate to Dirty Harry. I thought he was cool back in the day before I knew he was a Republican, but um, <laughs> I, you know, I thought it was cool back then to be that cold and distant. And how how do you manage that? And and I could never manage it. But when you do see someone that's relatable, uh, that uh, is weak occasionally, does make mistakes. I know I sound like I sound like somebody's mother telling you uh uh you know you know or, or your school teacher but that's that's what i i i find to be strengths in in uh in heroes well i want to uh, slide on the coattails of that one um and add to it i love the fact that um and for heroes in my case i also look for the idea of you know self-sacrifice to the point you know you know you have to do the thing well in this case james bond gives up everything to do the right thing, to save the world. Like that whole idea of sacrificing oneself for a greater good has always appealed to me in, as a, in a heroic sense. I just, I love that idea. So I guess that's why I kind of love all of the films because he's doing everything he does for the greater good. But this one really rang true for me because, you know, of that self-sacrifice that he does in the end. You know, he can't go back to the girl. He can't get off the island, but he's going to do the job, damn it. Do you know what I really wanted, though, at that end scene? And 
I wanted them to, when, when the woman says, but James, surely they'll find a cure or whatever. And I, w I wanted him to go, oh, damn, you're right. And then go, well, too late now. <laughs> but, <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. Well, I, and to kind of throw back to the literary Bond again, at the end of You Only Live Twice, Bond is actually left for dead after his encounter on the island. And then he pops up in the next novel, like five years later in the literary chronology, and he's been brainwashed and, you know, they have to deprogram him. So who knows where they can go from here? I mean, it won't be Craig, but maybe that's a way back in. Who knows? And I mean, and what's less painful, mourning a loss or him being locked up in a lab for God knows long and Leia say do in the kid right? Do I have anything to do with him? Like it is the ultimate act of self-sacrifice. Like, yeah. He, he he sacrifices himself out of love yeah out of real and love and that is like one of the only times it's ever i've even gotten misty-eyed in a james bond movie i'm like you knew what he was doing and you're like holy crap man that takes some balls <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it, it's interesting uh, in in when i look at craig's bond compared to the others and and those those climactic moments um, the second half, I mean, even, you don't know, forget the climax, but the second half of the film, I would say the second half of the film is the closest I've seen to, I mean, well, I mean, I guess in Skyfall too, but over the last couple of films and especially in the second half, you see Bond really grappling with, with his soul. And when you compare that to the blunt instrument in the first film, you know, it's, he's like a bulldozer. And and this one by the end of this film, he's sitting in that. He's he's making decisions. I mean, we've seen him have. Uh, here's a question: Have we heard him say "I love you" before? Have we heard him say that? Did he say it in Majesty's Secret Service? The Diana Rig? I, I believe remember. he does, but at a graveside. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like there, I'm sorry, I'm now running the film in my head. <laughs> Skip ahead. And... We'll get back to you. Uh, yeah, but... all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, like, like how many we hear characters say "I love you" in films all the time. You know, uh, uh, you know, I I kind of wish that she said he said "I loved you" and she said "I know," uh, but <laughs> um, you know, like, but for Bond, those words carried real weight like real weight in this particular film in a way that we hadn't seen before. Like there's, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, Tom In Skyfall. He starts to go back and deal with the traumas of his past. I'm going to skip Spectre uh, <laughs> because I think they tried that in Spectre and it just doesn't work. It, it doesn't, it does not land. But in this film, not only is he dealing with with his past and he's talking about how he doesn't trust anybody and how he has issues with trust uh, and they sort of and and uh, rightfully so, because, you know, we uh, we also always... like Casino Royale. So, yeah, I know I mean, for crying out loud, he had a gravesite blow up in his <laughs> face. <in this one. laughs> um, but I mean, all these issues of trust and there's something about him that becomes whole at the end of this film. And it's not, you know, you talk about Tim, you talk about doing things for the greater good. I think, I think that means so many different things to so many different people. And I think Craig, or I think, uh, I think you, Connery and Goldfinger is doing things for the greater good. Mm -hmm. But in this one, the greater good is, is it, it's dealing with people individually. It's not just save the world. It's saving, like realizing the, the specific people that really matter. Oh, for sure, because he was doing yeah. it to save Madeline and the, and the kid. I mean, yeah. everybody else is a bonus, but those are the two he has to save. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, in any of the other movies, we never had a sense of the weight of the accumulation of all the other events that he's experienced in his life. Here we did. Yes. And that's what made yeah. it more important, that much more poignant. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, this, you know, I, I think when we talked about it, we talked about it a little bit before, but, but the fact that they brought continuity into Craig's arc gives weight to this moment. Yeah, totally. Um, had, had he just died, um, had he just died and it was like so many of the other films, even, even the Brosnan films, which were 
trying at some th- loose thread, but really it, it just one-offs. If he just died at the end of it, um, it wouldn't land the same way. It wouldn't no. land the same way. Uh, uh, Tim, did you make it through uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service? <laughs> I did. And all I can remember is it's not New Year yet. And there's a big smooch. But no, he doesn't actually say he because at the wedding, there's the kiss. But again, then they go off and have their own conversations. And then they're in the car. So no, he never actually gets to say it. Instead, you know, he says we have all the time in the world, which I guess in James Bond's vernacular, much like as you wish means I love you. Uh, Anyway, uh, well, guys, okay. I mean, we're, we're starting to run out of time. Just real quick, before we screen it or skip it, I would love to know, what do you do next? What is what is Bond 26? I mean, obviously, we're recasting. Do you straight up reboot? Do you go full Casino Royale? Do you continue the arc? What do you do? Wow. Both. both. <laughs> well, you could do you both, can you? Yeah, How do you both? Think about it. If you, who, what Casino do you do? Royale Turn left or right? You do both. Oh. From Brosnan to... Uh... Yeah, that's true. Craig, you you continue the through lines and have have a new person be James Bond. Oh, and that was he the doesn't other necessarily thing I... have to like be, have it be his designate, have it be his right call sign or something, and even still have Lashana Lynch as 007 and Naomi Harris, who is consistently underrated in these things, as Money Penny. Oh, the, totally, you know, the whole nine yards, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And then, then thank you for mentioning the whole M and the continuity thing, Dave, because there's that scene where Bond is talking to M and then there's the paintings of all the other M's around them. Like right. they're all there. So there's obviously a form of continuity in the series, even if it's just little winks and nods to the audience who have been with the series. But yeah, you can totally find some way to tie it into the continuity and reboot it because they've been doing it for what, since 62. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, my understanding of a reboot is none of the films prior to it mattered. Uh, and uh, so that's not exactly a reboot, Dave, I don't think, what you're suggesting. No, 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 not at all. Yeah. Reimagining. <laughs> no. I mean, my, uh, uh, I, think, I think the next James Bond just walked behind you, Tim. I'll tell her that. <laughs> Jane Bond, whatever. Or he might be there right now. It's yeah. Oh, there it is. There's the next James Bond. You mean this guy right here? Yeah, yeah. His name is uh, George. Mm. <laughs> I'm up to no good. Mm. Um, George. I, um, well, I, 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 what I was thinking about when, when uh, Craig's comment about uh, uh, he, Bond has to be male. I mean, listening to you uh, uh, explain that, it makes sense to me. And and I'm liable to go, okay, yeah, he's correct. But my initial thought about uh, the next Bond and where we go next is that uh, it, it perhaps it was a bit arrogant of me, but I, I say Bond is a fictional character. So Bond can be any shade of uh, she, him, or they uh, as anybody wants. Uh, I mean... Um, you could change the name. I, I, I would, I wouldn't flinch at any uh, uh, new Bond, whether regardless of who they are. Yeah, uh, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be I great? Think, Pardon? I think that's why they split 007 and James Bond. Yeah, yeah I think mm. that's why we have these two very distinct visions of what 007 <laughs> is and what James Bond is now. Well, I love the idea that we can have these conversations about a character that has been known a certain way for fifty years, and say. Why not? That's, yeah, it is really unique. Um, it, it's interesting. I I've wrestled with myself again. What do we do? What do they do next? I think they've got themselves in an interesting corner. I think they have to go straight up reboot. They may just keep some of the same cast, but I think you almost have to like they did that with Craig because they kept um, they kept uh, Judy Dench from the from the uh, previous from the uh, Brosnan years but they made him a new bond. Uh, I, they started with a straight up reboot but they kept the character. I think they have to go that route if like I thought to myself well does bond get plastic surgery and he yeah. shows yeah. up um, if they do that they have to keep the story arc with Madeline Swan. They mm-hmm. have to keep the super blood. They have to keep the I have a child but I never see them. He's now a deadbeat dad. You know, they have to, all of these things now are affected by not just straight up rebooting him. But here's the thing. 
throughout any of the films, do we ever know that his name, like until Skyfall, when we see he has his parents, we never get a sense of it being anything more than sort of a, a designate, like a name. We understand in Skyfall that in this arc, okay, James Bond was a person. Mm-hmm. I think you can continue on. And I mean, I think they honor that bond by making Bond sort of a new designate, which really you could apply to the Brosnan, Dalton, Moore, Lazenby, Connery things, because well, we never got a sense of their characters sort of past and who they were as people. I think this they, is the mark where you get a chance to sort of reinvent the line of there being a Bond and there being a 007. Yes. I mean, well, and I there's Bond a has to be that. banned, but... 007? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a precedent for that already in the series because we've seen it that uh, that M, you know, is apparently not just a designate, but has also been the name of M's actual character. Right. Like, there's been Miles. There's been, uh, you know, whatever Judy Dench's M's name was. So it's not. And Ray Fine's M is also an M name. So it's there's a precedent for it. So maybe you're right, Dave. Maybe that's the way to go. So it was the additional roles of Q and M and a money penny in this episode, the way they had more business to do, a sort of, uh, sort of, okay, you get your time to shine because you're not going to be back, or were they setting up for bigger roles in future Bond movies? See, I think it's setting up for bigger roles going down the line, be it a 007 movie or be it a Bond movie. Like, I would not be shocked if they try to do a Bond movie and they try to do a 007 movie in some That's way, shape, or form. Yeah. There is a precedent for that because Die Another, Die Another Day, the intent was to spin off into a Jinx franchise. Yeah. With, yeah. Uh, Halle Berry, and it never never came to because oh. people hated Jinx. Um, <laughs> but that was, that was the intent. Why do we always, why am I always the last one to find out we hate people? <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought we liked Jinx. Uh, <laughs> I will. I want to say also that the it's it's sort of a, a roundabout way, but uh, you, you but Tim mentioned um, a, a do we um, does Bond get a, a, a plastic surgery, and in the last thank God it was the last uh, Pink Panther movie, <laughs> he runs into James Bond Roger Moore and finds out it's Lieutenant Caluso who had plastic surgery to look like James Bond. Which was the only funny part in the movie because James Bond was doing all Lieutenant Caluso stuff. But anyway, around about uh, plastic surgery, James Bond story. Love it. There it is. Mm. Um, well, guys, this has been fun. This has been a lot of fun. I, this has I, been great. It's been, oh, I, I could keep going. I just was worried about time, but uh, we should screen it or skip it. No time to die. Screen it or skip it. Screen it. Totally screen it. Absolutely screen it. Well, that's a unanimous one. I'll, I'll say screen it on this one as well. I think this one. Uh, now it's interesting because I don't think it's going to win over any people who are lukewarm to Bond. So if you, I should say that I don't. I, if you're a lukewarm Bond fan and you're like, I don't really care. Um, I, although there's more into it, but I mean, Tom's daughter is not going to give a damn about this. <laughs> she's not in. She is, she, but she finally sits down to watch that. She's going to go. That's what Bond should be like. She has never seen a Daniel Craig Bond. By the way, before you go, I knew personally a Bond villain as a child. Yes, uh, please tell the story. Yes, yes. Uh, his his name. Uh, you know, he, he, what's his character's name? Gustav Graves uh, from, uh, is it Die Another Day? Yeah. yeah. I was his camp counselor when he was an eight-year-old camper. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and so did you notice any of these tendencies early on? Hello. Uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's uh, uh, Maggie Smith's, Toby Stevens is his name, Maggie Smith's son. Uh, and yeah, I was his com- camp counselor. So she, I didn't, he's Maggie Smith's son. I didn't realize that. Yes. Toby Stevens is, yeah. Uh, uh, Robert Stevens, the, the director who did, uh, uh, he, he didn't 
direct prime of his gene brody he starred as the school teacher and that's where maggie and and robert stevens met had two kids toby was one of them yeah on screenfish radio you learn something new every day boys right i did not know that one that's awesome did i wait i i have to ask this to tom where like, it's in uh, just outside of Kitchener, Waterloo. So Maggie was doing a, uh, a performance at Stratford, and she needed to send her kids to summer camp. And I was working at a camp out. Of, uh, it's a, a Kitchener, Waterloo Y camp, and it was uh, called Camp Kawai, K I dash W A Kitchener, Waterloo dash Y. No, honestly, guys, this has been this has been so much fun. Uh, I really, really appreciate the guys you, you taking the time. Uh, to chat with the film film with me now is the chance where you guys get to plug uh, let's let's hear what uh, I, I mentioned it before at the beginning but let's let's hear what you got going on uh, Tim now you're tell us about the mind reels oh man um, we actually we just celebrated our 10th anniversary we've been oh, writing for 10 years that's right yeah this, and this week I will hit post number 5,000. So, um, but yeah, we just kind of cover film, television. Um, I'm now hip deep in Toronto after dark this year, which I love. Um, and I'm working my way through a whole bunch of classic TV series, which is why I knew Jamie Farr was cleaner because I'm watching MASH on the weekends. Um, yeah, I'm just digging into anything I can find right now and just watching everything. And I get to write for Dave sometimes. Awesome. When you're not that busy, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got so much free time, as we can see. Right. <laughs> um, wow. Okay, Tom, um, what about you? Uh, well, I'm uh, currently writing for Original Sin and also Another Place. David? Northern Stars. Northern Stars. <laughs> <laughs> Northern Stars. Ca. I uh, also have a podcast called Rewind Fast Forward. Uh, if you happen to be at the Ukrainian Film Festival this year, you will see me introducing a few films uh, for the Ukrainian Film Festival. And I'm hosting the uh, Toronto Arts Film Festival at the end of this month. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's great. That's exciting. Yeah, it is fun. Um, that's me. Great. And well, David... Well, as 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 you said at the beginning, I am the czar and the impresario. I am the boss over at In the Seats, In the Seats.ca, where we cover oh, film, television, basically the moving image at large with our crack staff, which you, Steve and Tim, are. I'm very thankful that you take part in over there with us. And also, I am the host and genial producer of In the Seats With, where we sit down with a wide range and variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And you can find us on all podcast services on that front as well. And uh, that's about it. And like, like you said, like all the free time we all have really, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. No, honestly, I know you guys are all really busy and I'm so glad that you could join us and, and, and have some fun with this. Um, for, for you at home, a reminder, you can find us wherever podcasts are available uh, and on YouTube as we continue this wild and wacky experiment of video uh, of video content, if you will. Um, and uh, if you go to the podcast page on screenfish.net, you can download Fishing for More, uh, some questions to help you get the conversation about this film where you are. And uh, we will be back next week. But uh, I, I think we're talking about the eyes of Tammy Faye, but I'm not going to say that, that credit role, but he will be back. I will be. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Norton will return. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're really excited to, to for that. And guys, just again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, for you at home, we started the conversation. This was Screenfish. Fish.